My, my name is Alice Madden. I'm the board chair in sustainability at the University of Colorado Denver. Uh, we're the official sponsor of the sustainability series, which is now in its fourth year. And it was started by a small group of really dedicated folks. Uh, most of the original founders are here. We have built a, an advisory board around it who, who looks at speakers who are really on the cutting edge around sustainability that are dedicated to changing the local scene and the Colorado scene. Um, I know many of our advisory board members are here. Could you all just wave your hands, Mark, Greg, come on, Greg, say hello, and please um, get it afterwards. We really hope you stick around. Um, this is supposed to be a networking event. So afterwards, please stick around, have another beer, try to meet some of our founders. How many students are here? Raise your hands, Tom. Okay, these are future employees of yours, so make sure you meet them. How many underemployed searching for jobs? That usually gets <laughs> So like I said, stick around afterwards, try to, try to meet each other. Um, I have just a couple of announcements before we start. There's a couple of flyers on, on the back table. Um, one event um, is the, the, the 13th Annual Worth Chair Sustainability Awards Luncheon. I don't know if you've ever been to one before, uh, but it's kind of a who's who gathering of environmentalists in Colorado. It's, it's actually been going on for 15 years. There was a little bit of a hiatus. Um, Tim Worth will be there. There's a, a, a group of various folks that we're giving awards to. One is uh, the, the former CU Law Dean, David Getches, who died of pancreatic cancer last year. Um, one is the Colorado Foundation of Water Education, Veterans Green Jobs. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Colorado Alliance for Environmental Education. I don't know if you're familiar with them. If you're not, you should take a look at their website. Really an amazing group of dedicated teachers trying to get environmental learning in our K through 12 schools. And a program called Win, Win for Schools that was started by um, NREL, CSU, and, and the Governor's Energy Office, putting wind turbines on schools and turning it also into a learning tool for not only the kids at the school, but for engineering students. It's a totally cool program. So anyway, come join us on April 25th. There's a flyer back there. Um, if you sign up um, on the sign-in sheet, you'll get periodic emails from me, and you'll, you can get information about it. Next month, on May 1st, the sustainability series is going to be about biofuel and biorefining. I hope you can come. We have just one speaker confirmed. We're talking to some other folks, but we're going to have Zchem um, here next month. Uh, but I'm really excited about it tonight. I have two old friends and one new friend. I really don't know Evan, but we're friends already now. Um, and I'm going to save Andrew for last so I can you know, give him a little bit of a roast. So. <laughs> but Doug, Doug Vilsack um, is, is became a good friend. We met um, through some work at the CU Law School. and We both have a love of, of working in Africa. Uh, and he's done a lot more than I have, which you'll hear about in tonight. And uh, a little bit about his background. He, he's a lawyer. Um, he works at Davis, Graham, and Studs, Stubbs. Uh, he's the executive director of Elephant Energy. It's a Colorado nonprofit. It works to improve the quality of life in Africa and on the Navajo Nation by pioneering ventures that pr provide access to appropriate sustainable energy technologies. Their website is elephantenergy.org. Uh, he got a JD from CU Law and his BA from the Colorado College. He studied natural resources management. Um, he practices environmental law, Indian <coughs> law, renewable and alternative energies at DGS. Um, he's been to Nib Namibia off and on and living there off and on since 2005, continuing his work with this community-based conservation. And I don't know if you um, have heard his name before. Do you mind if I mention? I I'm the president of the fan club of his father. His father is Governor Bill Sackno, Secretary of Agriculture. He's really a terrific guy doing a great job for President Obama. Um, Evan Hunsey is the general counsel uh, for and does business development for Nocaro. Is that how you say it, no, Yeah, yeah. And they are the only maker of a, a, a rechargeable solar light bulb. So we're going to hit, hear more about their work tonight. He's been practicing law for about 14 years. Uh, he got his JD and his MBA from CU Law, CU Law and CU Boulder. He has his Bachelor's of Science degree from Emory University. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. We're looking forward to that. And uh, last but not least, and who will be our first speaker, is Andrew Romanoff. Where did he disappear to? <laughs> yeah, I won't make this too too long. But um, Andrew and I are war buddies. We uh, we first met when we were running for office. We served in the legislature for eight years together. The first four were in the minority, and the second four in the majority. And I'll just give you a hint: majority is a lot more fun. Uh, he, he was he uh, he came to me one day and was like, you know what? I think we can change the state. And uh, starting in about 2002, we had a nonstop effort. 
that kind of uh, finally came to fruition in 2004. We took over. He became speaker. I was the majority leader, and we really had just a tremendous time personally, professionally, probably more fulfilling than I don't know if anything we'll, we'll ever do again in our lives. But he's doing some amazing work at IDE right now that you'll hear uh, more about tonight, as well as the greenhouse. Uh, after Bill Ritter was elected, I think Andrew set a tone for the state. Um, he would say every day he wanted to make Colorado the best place in the nation to raise a family. And he dedicated his life to that. And I think he had his finger in every single policy change that happened during that time frame. Um, it was a really pleasure and honor working with him. And I want to introduce my friend, Andrew Oma. I speak Madden, and for those of you who don't know Alice, I just wanted to provide a brief translation. When she introduced, uh, that's right, can you hear me all right? When she introduced our friend uh, Doug Vilsack as working for Davis, Graham, and Studs, it was really a window. I think. I, uh, Alice, uh, you owe Alice, uh, we all, I think, owe Alice a debt of gratitude for her efforts, not just as the uh, worth share, but really on behalf of uh, Colorado's sustainability efforts more broadly. Will you thank Alice for her leadership? I was at an event at CU last night, and I met a young man, a student there, and uh, he said, well, when did you, didn't you used to do something important? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, I, you know, I served in the, in the state legislature, and he said, well, well, when was that? Can you, a little history lesson. So I said, well, I, w I was served from 2001 to 2009, Alice and I were turned out of the state house back in 2009, and he said, oh, well, well that, that was before my time. <laughs> a toddler? Um, I, uh, I'm happy to tell you about work that's going on in Colorado now. I'm happy that you're here and sharing a little bit of your Tuesday evening with us. Uh, to tell you a little bit of a story. This story starts, like most good stories, in a bar. Uh, and not just any bar, actually, uh, this one. Uh, so stop me if you've heard this before, but let's just say a guy, where's that guy? A guy walks into a bar, and I'm going to actually ask the guy himself, Doug Bilsack, to continue this story. <laughs> so I, I latched on late and told him I could come, so now I'm inserted in this light. Um, so uh, actually, I guess it was the fall of 2008, uh, I was here for an Obama event, and I was kind of standing in the corner uh, drinking a beer and, and not knowing anybody at that point in time. And uh, I turned to the guy next to me, and I said, you know, so what do you do? Um, uh, he said, my name is Mike Callahan, uh, and uh, I work at NREL, but I also run an organization uh, that distributes solar-powered lights in Peru called Power Mundo. Uh, and so I was like, well, that's funny, uh, because I work as a lawyer here with Davis Graham, uh, but I also run an organization in Namibia uh, that distributes solar-powered lights uh, to people as well. <laughs> and so just kind of standing in the corner here, we realized that we basically did the very similar things. Mike runs a for-profit, I run a non-profit. Uh, for all intents and purposes, we do this. It's the same thing. Uh, basically, working in uh, developing countries, trying to set up distribution networks for small scale solar technologies. And so, that was kind of one of the beginnings or the thought process behind some of the greenhouse. Um, you know, why, why can't we have these conversations every day and kind of run into a, people in a logical place instead of standing in the corner at the, the one who <laughs> drink the beer? So, so uh, Doug and Mike shared this story with me about a year and a half ago. And as Doug said, it got us thinking. How many other folks in Colorado are doing international development work uh, without knowing it, uh, without knowing each other? And the answer, as you may know, turns out to be more than 100. We've listed some of the organizations here doing work in Africa, Asia, Latin America, education, healthcare, microfinance, energy, agriculture, sanitation, uh, water, women's empowerment or education. This is just a partial list. Some, as Doug said, uh, nonprofits, some for profits, all based in our little landlocked state, which got us thinking, what if there was some place other than a bar, no offense to the wine coop, fine brewing establishment, but some place other than a bar that might bring these organizations and entrepreneurs together. And that was the genesis of an idea that we're calling the greenhouse. We aim to create a home for imaginative and inspired and innovative and integrated, and more specifically, international development. Although for the sake of tonight's conversation, we might also focus on the way in which these organizations are also engaged in sustainable, or what my friend Dan Westner calls just and sustainable development. The mission of this project, uh, in a nutshell, the goal of the greenhouse, 
is to advance sustainable solutions to global poverty by enabling organizations like Doug's and Mike's uh, and individual entrepreneurs to do three things. To collaborate, to innovate, and to operate more effectively. And I'll just pause on each of these points. What do we mean by collaboration? We canvassed a number of the organizations that I just listed, about 75 groups last year, to ask whether they might be interested in sharing services. And we found a great deal of appetite uh, for doing so, from back office functions like accounting and payroll, HR, PR, IT, uh, to field work. A lot of these organizations are doing development work, not just in the same continent, but literally in the same country. So integrating some of those operations, both at home and overseas, uh, turns out to be a high priority for a lot of the groups that we're bringing together. We're also interested uh, in allowing our partners uh, to innovate, to generate new, particularly sustainable development ventures. Say you've got an idea. You come from another country or you visit another country and you come home with an idea for a product or service that you might want to aim at folks who live at the base of the economic pyramid. Where I work at IDE, we serve people largely who make a dollar a day. But you want to know, is the product or service that I've come up with uh, sustainable? Is it viable? Is it scalable? If you want to know if it's profitable, you'll need some expertise there. You'll want to develop and analyze a business plan. This facility will offer some guidance along that front by allowing us to convene practitioners and scholars and students, like many of you. We've uh, had in mind to create a, a kind of a learning laboratory. Uh, and we've started partnering with a number of institutions of higher education to flesh out this part of the project. We've talked to folks at CSU, at CU, uh, at Regis, uh, at DU to figure out a way to bring the expertise from those schools, those institutions, uh, literally under one roof. So we want this program to allow folks to cohabitate, to collaborate, to innovate, to start incubating new, sustainable, in our case, particularly market-based approaches to development, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, but at a basic level, we also want to make it possible for folks to operate uh, their uh, programs more effectively. Uh, so we've got uh, in mind a building, which I'll share with you, that dedicates more than half of its floor plan uh, to common spaces, to conference rooms and teleconference rooms and classrooms and lecture halls. There's room for a, a workshop, an exhibition space, facilities that wouldn't be available to these organizations individually, but are when we pool our resources. We're not the only folks, of course, to come up with this idea for pooling resources. There are, in fact, more than uh, 200 examples of shared space initiatives around the country, including one, of course, just a couple blocks from here, uh, the Alliance Center, the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado, thanks to the leadership of folks like John Powers, who got the idea eight years ago to bring a number of environmental organizations under one roof. There was a, a study that came out of the Tides Foundation out of San Francisco uh, and the Nonprofit Centers Network, this sort of umbrella group for these shared space initiatives, a study they did last spring that analyzed the benefits of this approach. They found among the organizations they canvassed that were sharing spaces, significant numbers reported an increase in their ability to uh, improve recruitment, reduce turnover, boost their revenue, expand their programs, increase their efficiency, enhance the morale of their staff. It turns out folks like being surrounded by other folks who are doing the same kind of thing. Perhaps that's why some of you are here tonight. Uh, and uh, in the ability of these organizations to fulfill their mission. The ultimate point, of course, of this exercise is not to, to just create a more pleasant working environment for folks who engage in this kind of activity, although that's a benefit, uh, but it's really to enable us to advance the mission that we all share. Uh, we've signed up a number of groups already. Uh, we hope to open this facility at capacity uh, at the end of the year. Uh, the organizations that have signed on so far uh, are doing work, as I said, in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Some of these groups are represented here tonight. And maybe I'll pause and just see if... Uh, I know Kathy Leslie, who is the CEO of Engineers Without Borders, would rather I not recognize her tonight, so I'll, I won't do that. Um, but she's here. Uh, we've got uh, folks... Who else is here from the, this coalition? I know Icatus, Mark Reiner is here, um, Steve uh, Katsiros and Evan Husting are both with No Carol, and, and uh, Evan will talk in a moment, other folks from this coalition. So we've got a happy problem of uh, a waiting list now of organizations that are trying to join us. In fact, we outgrew the first space we identified for this project. It proved to be too small. We outgrew that building before we moved in. We've landed instead uh, on a facility in central Denver. These groups are scattered around the metro area. IDE, where I work, is in Golden, Engineers Without Borders, another anchor to this project, is in Boulder, but we're all converging on a spot in central Denver, not far from here, uh, more specifically at the corner of 
33rd and Arapaho. Those of you who know the space, uh, about a mile, mile and uh, a half uh, northeast of where we uh, stand right now. The building itself is owned by another partner in this project, and I'll introduce her in a moment. Uh, she doesn't actually own the building itself, but she works for the organization that does, Melissa Rommel from the Denver Housing Authority. And that's an important addition to this project, because our goal is not just to create some kind of ivory tower for folks who engage in international development, but instead create an institution that contributes to the community in which we happen to find ourselves. And more specifically, uh, to cultivate relationships with the community, in our case, Curtis Park and Five Points uh, in particular, to engage the community, to revitalize uh, a part of uh, Denver. The leaders in that effort include the folks from Denver Urban Gardens. They're the one organization in this collaborative effort that doesn't do international development, uh, but they're moving a few blocks from their current site to our building uh, to share space and share ideas, move their headquarters there, uh, create a demonstration garden uh, nearby so kids will learn a little bit about how to grow food and then, if they stay for the rest of the show that takes place in that building, they can learn what life is like for people who have to grow food to survive around the world, the subsistence farmers that, that we serve, uh, and the work that goes on among our other partners. We're really trying to create a very dynamic, interactive experience, not just for the staff and the interns and the volunteers who will share space in this facility, uh, but also for the community, uh, particularly students who might be inspired by what they see there, to take an interest in the rest of the world or in their own backyard. Uh, we're lucky to have a partner in this project. The owner of the building is the Denver Housing Authority. And I'll ask Melissa Rummel, uh, our project manager, to just say a few words about DHA's interest in this space. There's a mic, too, if you want. Hopefully I can talk loud enough. Can anyone hear, everyone hear me? Um, DHA is an unlikely partner, maybe on the outset, to win for the project. But I think it's important um, to kind of to state why DHA, how this organization, how everyone came together. Um, DHA has done a lot of work in the Curtis Park neighborhood. We've put a lot of federal funds into the neighborhood over the last really 10 years. We bought the building in 2002, um, and we bought the act to actually tear it down. I don't like it to admit it today, but it's true. We bought it to tear it down, and we're going to build housing there in between. Then and now, we've really grown a lot as an organization, and we've we've had close ties with the community, and we realize it's a major asset. We've done a lot of housing in the neighborhood, and that's not all we do anymore. We really are in the business of community revitalization, not just housing. So it all came together at the right time. Um, we met IDE first, really through Andrew, um, through the Red Line Gallery, and, and different relationships we have in the area. And suddenly this great idea was born. We had a building, it needed tenants. Um, we have an obligation and a, you know, a need for the community to bring something more, an asset to the community, not just housing, but how do you kind of create an open door policy, bring education, bring opportunity. So um, an unlikely um, you know, friendship on the start perhaps, but it's really, I think in the last six months and even maybe longer, nine months, we've developed it and the project has gotten you know more legs and has really come a long way but we feel very fortunate to be working with IDE and EWB Denver Gardens and really excited about it it's an innovative project for us but I think it's the start of many like this that we'll be doing so we're happy to be a part of it and really happy to have the support of the great tenants Thanks. Melissa's right. In many ways, uh, Denver Housing Authority, Denver Urban Gardens, IDE, Engineers Without Borders, ICADIS, a lot of these partners are moving in together before we even started dating. But uh, the synergies that are emerging from this partnership, I think, are pretty exciting to all of us. We've also reached out to some other groups that serve the Five Points community or broader parts of Denver uh, as a way to engage them and the clients they serve uh, in this process. Probably not as physical tenants in most cases, uh, but as partners in community development. So we're excited about some of those partnerships too. Now you may be wondering to yourself, where is, what does this building look like? This magical space, the home for 30 organizations, 120 employees, thousands of volunteers, a community garden, a, uh, a workshop, a farmer's market, that's I'll show you uh, in a minute, learning laboratories, a lecture hall, where on earth could this building be? Once upon a time, uh, this is what the, our new home looked like. The building was built in 1882. It started as uh, a home, as most may mentioned, for the uh, Denver City Railway Company, the horse-drawn trolley cars. It housed both the cars and the horses. 
So a lot of folks refer to this space as a horse barn. It became a warehouse uh, over time. Time has not been terribly kind to this building. It doesn't look like this anymore. It looks like this. Um, and it needs a little bit of work and a lot of love and labor uh, and talent and treasure. Uh, that's what we're going to dedicate uh, over the next several months. Um, our architectural firm, there's a, a firm out of Boulder called Trace Birds, has come up with a rendering of what the site will look like at the end of this renovation period, which we expect to complete by the end of the year. Um, as I mentioned, the front one corner of the building where Denver Urban Gardens will also house its headquarters hosts uh, a farmer's market. Curtis Park is considered a food desert, so bringing fresh produce to that community, not just to the staff who are quite happy to now have that advantage uh, upstairs, uh, but to the community as well is one way for us to engage the community in this effort. We've also talked about opening up a, a, a retail shop, oh, where's Michaela? Uh, so that we can start selling some of the products uh, that a lot of our clients around the world uh, produce at a profit to them. Um, as another way to engage folks uh, in this building. Uh, so, uh, pretty excited about this space. We're doing a leads analysis to make sure that this space is as energy efficient uh, as possible and try to create um, some other advantages uh, along the way. Um, the architectural firm itself, Trace Birds, uh, specializes in some historic preservation using, in this case, the, uh, the floorboards of uh, maple uh, from old boxcars uh, as the staircase. Uh, we're going to try to flood the place with lights. There'll be a skylight on top, um, punch a lot of holes for windows. Um, this is not our building, uh, by the way. It's Cactus Communications, which you can also visit at 15th and Little Raven to give you some flavor of what this space will look like. So we're pretty excited about the sunlight, the steel, the wood, the historic preservation piece, uh, the energy efficiencies, um, and really the energy that we're trying to bring uh, to this building. Inside, uh, we've designed an atrium uh, so that folks will be able to increase the circulation throughout the building. Uh, I don't know that we've had a feng shui analysis yet, but um, <laughs> it's a very interactive space. Um, on the first floor, as I'll talk about, there's a lecture hall, uh, lunch room, reception area, exhibition space, a multi-purpose room um, on the back of the first floor. Um, and throughout the building, uh, there are Skype rooms and meeting rooms, places where folks can congregate uh, and interact. Uh, I'm missing one slide. Uh, upstairs, there's also a lecture hall, a classroom space, um, and a spot for folks who do um, international development to interact with their colleagues uh, overseas. It's a pretty important priority um, for a lot of us. So in the back of that upstairs space, uh, our conference rooms and teleconference facilities for that place. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, that, for that purpose. You know, less important in some ways than the physical aspects of the building is what goes on inside. And I'm going to turn things over to Evan uh, Husney, who works for Nocaro. As Alice mentioned, they're the inventors of the world's first solar-powered light bulb. Uh, because it's one example, although we can't claim to have incubated that business, of the kind of venture that we'd like to grow in this building. Sustainable, in this case, profitable businesses that serve folks around the world, especially folks who live, as I said, at the base of the economic pyramid. So I'm going to switch presentations here uh, and ask Evan to chime in. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. So can everyone hear me? Do I have to put the mic on? I'm good? OK. Steve, can you hear me? What? OK, good. <laughs> he hears me every day, all day, so he's like, he knows my voice. Uh, Thank you very much, Andrew, and thanks to Alice and uh, to the World Sustainability Series for inviting us. We're honored and privileged to be here as uh, just one minor example, I think, of what the greenhouse is trying to accomplish. And um, So I guess I'm just going to kind of give you guys a, a little bit about Nocaro and who we are, and then I think uh, we'll probably open it up for questions and, and talk more. Um, so uh, the name of the company is Nocaro, which, uh, let's see, how do we work this thing, Andrew? On the right. On the right, see, he gives me this thing. Oh, there we go, got it. I see, I just pressed the big green light. <laughs> um, so, uh, our, our main goal is to utilize solar products to, uh, to help those around the world that live without electricity and in what we refer to commonly as energy poverty. So, uh, our belief is that the, introduce, the introduction of solar into these environments uh, improve health, uh, greens the environment, reduces poverty, and empowers communities. 
Um, so basically, we were formed in uh, June of 2010 following Steve's uh, brilliant invention of a solar light bulb uh, and launched the company with uh, the first version of our solar light bulb and pretty quickly got a fair amount of attention and press, including a, a CNN interview that Ali Bashi ran uh, internationally. And, and after that, it was about 10 days after we launched, we started getting calls from around the world from people saying, hey, you know, how do we, how do we get these? Where can I, can I be the distributor? We want exclusivity for Ghana. You know, we, we think these are great for India. And so uh, we began our path of, of kind of trying to determine how we would, would move forward and get these products out there to the people that need them. So, um, you know, the main goal for the solar light bulb is to eliminate the use of harmful fuel burning light sources. So there are uh, uh, about 1.4 billion people in the world that live without electricity. Uh, and actually quite a few no more that live without access to reliable electricity. And all those people spend a lot of money uh, on fuel burning lights or on, on fuel for light. Um, these fuels have, they cause a lot of problems. Uh, make it difficult to, to work, to study. Um, they also have lots of ill effects in terms of, of any, everything from deaths to respiratory disease to problems with, uh, with vision. Um, and they also obviously have really bad environmental uh, effects in terms of pollution, the equivalent of about uh, 30 million cars per year. So uh, what we've done, or what Steve has invented to try and alleviate this problem and do our part is uh, a small, uh, fully integrated, portable solar light. So uh, it's pretty simple. You've got a solar panel here on the top. It's got a, a rechargeable AA battery, which is easily uh, changeable on the inside. It lasts for about one and a half to two years. And then also LED lights on the inside. So you just hang it out in the sun during the day, and you can pivot this bulb to, to face the sun, so you get a maximum uh, efficiency of charge. And then when it's dark enough and you come inside, you turn it on and it's got a high and a low setting uh, depending on what you want for that night. So um, it's also got a neat auto off feature which in bright light, uh, even if I had it in the on position, if it was too bright out, this wouldn't go on because it would save the battery. Uh, so it's also um, shadow resistant and it's rainproof and it's built to be really durable and last uh, for a long time. So again, you have to change the battery about every one and a half to two years, but, uh, but that's it. Um, so that's, that's the product, and we believe that it's got a lot of applications. Um, everything from disaster relief, safety, reduce, you're reducing monthly fuel expenses, increasing productivity. Uh, you know, afford, uh, it's an affordable small business opportunity for people that want to be entrepreneurs in, uh, in their local villages. Uh, it improves health and education, and obviously helps the environment. So our model, uh, as it's evolved, is really to find the right partners uh, in different markets around the world. And in every different market, the partners might be different. So it's everything from commercial partners, such as what we have in India, with a large company that sells our products through their existing distribution channel, to NGOs and charities, uh, such as what we have with a partner in Haiti. Uh, governments, we're in a lot of conversations with governments about them purchasing and either uh, you know, subsidizing or, or giving out the bulbs to people that need them. Um, the key is always that it's a partner that understands the local market and understands what distribution channel will work uh, and you know what will the people buy it and if so how. Um, so as Andrew kind of mentioned, you know the, one of the key points of our company that we decided from the very beginning was to to be a for-profit entity rather than a non-profit entity. And the real driver there was sustainability. Uh, we we believe that if we're a profitable venture, we ensure our own sustainability, and we can continue to, uh, you know, try to achieve our goal of getting these products out into the hands of the people that really need them. Uh, you know, if if you're a nonprofit, you obviously are in constant fundraising mode, and you never know if your funding might might dry up. So um, we also believe that you know we can, by being sustainable, we can continue to grow other economies by putting people to work in their markets as distributors or as partners, and they're growing their local economies by creating jobs and uh, increasing the flow of, of funds. Um, we uh, you know, we like to try to help educate the customers about how not only the light bulbs can en enhance their lives by you know, eliminating the harmful fu uh, fumes that they might otherwise be inhaling, or by allowing them to study uh, better and easier, um, but also by, you know, 
being able to actually make money with our products. For example, renting out the lights to their neighbors or uh, you know, buying 144 at a time and selling them to surrounding villages, building a business. Um, we also believe that people that pay for their products uh, will care more for them and, and ascribe more value to them, uh, which I think also uh, generates a, a sense of pride amongst people that pay for them and own them, um, and, and they'll take better care of them. Um, another thing that we've seen, and, and this isn't always the case, but there are lots of giving programs that just don't last. Um, and you know, we believe that, that if we can get people to really value what they're, what they're purchasing, that they'll, they'll last uh, longer. So some of the just accomplishments which we're, you know, we're pretty proud of, we, have, we, we know we have a long way to go and we're a small, pretty startup company still, but we've sold nearly 350,000 solar lights so far uh, in over 120 countries around the world. Um, we ship nightly out of our uh, facility in, in China and we also ship uh, larger quantities around the world by containers. Um, we've done uh, a couple of pilot programs, one of which I'll highlight here, is one done by the Mexican government uh, in 571 households there in four different locations. Uh, the metrics on, on everything from money savings to really compelling. Uh, we've got some good distributor relationships in place and we're having lots, uh, lots more conversations in other countries about additional distributor uh, partnerships. Um, we are launching additional products. We now have in addition to this light bulb, we have uh, a light bulb that's basically twice as big and twice as bright as this. We have a, uh, uh, two solar cell phone chargers, which are um, obviously what I said, they, they charge cell phones, imagine that. Uh, a one watt panel and a two watt panel. We have a solar battery charger, and then coming up uh, it, later this month, we're gonna be launching a solar book light, a solar book reading light. And I can't get Steve to stop inventing things, so I, I assume that uh, <laughs> If we talked again next month, we'd be talking about a couple of uh, additional products. Um, so that's uh, you know one of the one of the things that obviously when you're selling to these kind of bottom of the pyramid markets or developing countries is that the you know the, the, the price has to be affordable. And I think frankly, no matter how low the price ever gets for these products, they're never going to be as affordable as people would like them to be. However, we've done as much as we can to cut cost out. Uh, while keeping the quality high, and we have a low bulk pricing structure for our partners, whether it be the governments or NGOs or, or commercial distribution partners, to try and keep that price low. Um, from that point, the distribution partner, if they're a commercial partner, will set the price for themselves in the market. Uh, you know, obviously, they need to make a margin and make a living as well, so they'll mark it up a bit and then take it from there. Uh, depending on the price of the fuel that people typically use for light, the payback period uh, for using one of these bulbs instead of those fuels is anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months. Um, and again, it just depends on the cost of the fuel in that market. Um, and we are all, always trying to push the price down as much as we can. Uh, so, um, you know, part of what we do, as I mentioned, quality. We're very, very big on making sure that we use good components and quality manufacturing. We have a great manufacturer. Uh, it is in China, but it's a top, top notch manufacturer that really puts out quality products. Um, we also like to offer our, our customers the ability to brand our products. And you know, for example, in India, our commercial partner there has their own box, they have their own uh, logo on the ball, um, and so it's something that's pretty easy for us to do, but we're happy to OEM it and make it uh, more attractive for people in their markets. Um, so that's about it on a quick overview on NoCaro. As I said at the outset, I, I wish I could claim that Nocaro was a good example of how this greenhouse has incubated new sustainable development ventures, but the truth is, uh, Steve got this idea, uh, he's been working on this project before our building ever took shape. Uh, the work that's going on at Nocaro, the work that Doug um, asked to describe as well at, uh, at Elephant Energy in, in answer to your questions, uh, the work of all these organizations is one example of how we're trying to put Colorado on the map as a hub of international development activity. And maybe I'll just close on this point. Uh, once upon a time, I suppose, if you wanted to do this kind of work, you probably had to move to a coast. But the truth is, you can stay here and find a great deal of brain power uh, in our uh, environment, uh, and we hope under this particular roof. Um, it's not the only place where this kind of work is going on. I know Brad uh, Wells and Heidi Wells are, are here uh, doing a lot of terrific work around uh, low-cost, very durable uh, roofs 
uh, for folks in communities around the world. There's such a, a critical mass of development activity uh, in this state, in Colorado, that we want to make this facility, we believe it will be the nation's first collaborative center for international development, a focal point uh, of development work and help folks come up not just with new ideas uh, for products and services that uh, benefit folks uh, around the world, but really think through the business plans. How do you get the last mile distributed? How do you design the products to be as affordable as possible? How do you partner with micro lenders so the customers you serve can get the loans they need to buy the technology they want? How do you make our state literally a light uh, for all the world? That's the aim of this greenhouse project.